I don't, norm don't normally have two mics to hook up, so we're not trained how to do this in theology classes. <laughs> All right, I think I'm ready now. Well, let's start with a word of prayer and let's get into this morning's message. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in Heaven, thank you for just this beautiful Sabbath and thank you for this group of believers. Um, your people were gathered here together, Lord, and we want to grow in you, to learn more about you, to learn to be more like you. And we want to learn how to share you because you're so good. And we're, since you're so good, we, we don't want to hold that back. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, anoint um, my mouth, this time, this place, this group of people, uh, that we can experience you in a deeper way this morning, God. And we just give ourselves to you because you gave yourself for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to mention uh, a quick, a couple quick things work in the member ministries department at the Oregon Conference. Member ministries is basically the concept, um, we have a whole, whole department for it, where we want, it's the vision of the conference, where we want the members to be involved in what? Ministry. Isn't that cool? The ministry is not just the job of the pastor or people in the conference. Ministry is something that we can all enjoy and all be a part of. And I have to tell you what, ministry has been one of the most exciting things I've been able to be involved in in my life. Um, a lot of amazing experiences and really you're just working with the Holy Spirit, following the Holy Spirit's lead and you're on for a in for a big ride. God always has something amazing in store. And uh, maybe I'll be able to share some experiences, probably mostly this afternoon, of some really cool things I've seen. Uh, so, also concerning this afternoon, last night we had a seminar um, called Christ's Method. Um, and the concept behind a lot of my training is that um, innately my way of doing outreach is not the right way. Right? Christ's method, Christ's way is the right way. I want to share one quick story I shared last night. I, I work with Youth Rush, which uh, some of you might know what that is. It's a revamped call portering program that we run here in the Oregon Conference. And uh, I've done it for quite a few years when I was working back in Idaho Conference. I remember one time where I was driving by uh, working with some of the students and one of the uh, young boys was at a door and I saw him like this with his Bible out. I guess he had his Bible pulled out of his bag where he had his books and he's holding it up and, and there's the person and here's the Bible and here's him. And, he, and I could see the, the Bible just, just shaking and I thought, oh no, what's going on? So I pulled over and went up to the door and, uh, and I could see the guy was just yelling at me. It was a pastor from a different denomination that was retired, had some uh, real angst against Adventists. And... Um, so I walked up there and with all the Bible verses mustered in my mind, I took his sword down, take it easy, and I do -do 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 and just started shooting all the Bible verses I could think of about the Sabbath and the, because that was what the, this, the argument was about. And then he got angry and basically slammed the door and I walked away, <laughs> walked away, thinking that I had won. Um, <clears throat> I didn't win, I think we actually lost that day. But uh, what I want to say is, is that oftentimes when we do ministry, when we try to witness to people, it either becomes fight or flight. Instead of learning how to calmly, collectively, meaningfully engage someone in a spiritual conversation. Do you want to learn how to do that? Amen. Yes. Come this afternoon. We're going to talk specifically about that. We talked about a, lot, a lot about that last night. And uh, we have some... Uh, the presentation on PowerPoint, if you want it, you can get it from the pastor, I believe, from last night. But it will only be an hour, and it will be right after potluck, so I'm excited for that. Well, let's go ahead and dig into this morning's message. We can get the PowerPoint up here. We come up any moment here. Yeah. 
real quickly as we're getting that up, I'll mention a re quick recap of what we talked about last night. Um, so how many of you are familiar with Christ's method alone in reaching people? A few of you. It's uh, from Ministry of Healing, page 143 and 144, okay? Christ's method is a, basically a five-step process where, first step, it says Jesus mingled with men as one who did what? Sought their best good. Absolutely. Uh, good student. Uh, then he sympathized with men. And then three, he ministered to needs. Then he won their confidence. And then he bade them follow me. Now if you look at the, uh, that quote and you look at the last phrase, the phrase follow me, in that cultural context that actually meant when a rabbi would, uh, there was these young people called disciples and they would learn the, the whole word for word and when they came to these um, rabbis the rabbis if they w said well we'll teach you our doctrines our beliefs on Judaism and if they believe that they were good enough they'd say hey come and follow me and I'll teach you my what they called their yoke some different interesting words Jesus actually picked up on those words in the New Testament so when he said follow me that's communicating what it's communicating the belief system right follow me what we talked about last night was, is a lot of times we get stuck on either number one or on number five. Right? Mingling or just all about communicating the truth. Right? And that's all we want to talk about. Just either, I'll either do mingling or truth. But what we talked about last night is going through the whole process, one through five. We need to mingle. And then you can sympathize, minister to needs, win confidence. Then he bade them, last step, what? Follow me. Follow me. So that's something that uh, we talked about last night. And we'll be continuing on that theme this afternoon. We'll pray for, pray for the technical things. Because we need the PowerPoint. <laughs> Do you need my help there at all? Yeah, the main need. Oh, okay. Give us a few more minutes for some songs. Let's go ahead and start with another word of prayer. All right? Dear Lord, thank you for, um, once again, this day and this opportunity. Uh, we just pray for uh, your spirit to move this morning as we discuss this topic of uh, reaching people for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tell you what, almost every time I do this, there's some sort of technical difficulty. Last night it worked great, actually, doing the same method. So anyways, so this morning's message is entitled Inside Out, okay? Inside Out. And if you um, want to get the gist of the message, you're going to have to be dialed in, okay? Right here. You're going to have to, there's a lot of details. I'm going to go over a lot of information fairly quickly. And the first part of the message is going to be a tad bit philosophical, and then we'll move out of that, okay? So we're going to land, land, the, land the bird where it's real practical in the end here, okay? But let's go ahead and begin here. The first question I want to ask, who is man and how are we changed? Starting off here. I'm not a man. Right here? Okay. There we go. Who is man and how is he changed? What we begin by um, looking at here is the constitutional nature of man. Um, what are we composed of? Our, our innate parts, okay? Our, our machinery. How are we put together? Um, now, we're gonna, not going to look at every one of these verses listed here. Otherwise, we'll be here for quite some time. And I know many of you are looking forward to potluck as well as myself. So, we'll be moving through here fairly quickly. Genesis 2 verse 7 says... As many of you know, God did what he, he formed man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into him, into him the breath of life and man did what? Became a living soul, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7 is kind of the reverse of this scenario, right? It says when man dies, his, his breath, his spirit goes back to God from which it came and his, uh, the dust goes back to the ground, correct? Uh, James 2.26, it reads, uh, As the body, as faith without works is dead, so the body without the spirit is 
dead. You can continue to read through all these verses a similar concept. Matthew 22, verse 37 says, To love the Lord your God with all your heart. Oh, very good Bible students. You're memorizing in this church. Very good. All right. You can look up some of those verses later. Adventism as a whole has compiled this concept of what man is by looking at a synopsis of all the verses throughout the whole Bible that man is composed of different parts. Look at what it says here in Education, page 15 and page 16. Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were what? Weakened. His mental capacity was? His spiritual vision was? He had become subject to death. So what three things were, did, were lessened by the fall? It was his physical, his mental, and his spiritual capacity, right? Looking here, continuing on in verse, uh, or I think it's page 16, it says, To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of, I love these three phrases, redemption. This was the object of education. The great object of life. Now that's a lot summed up very shortly, isn't that? It's a lot of meat right there. So let's continue on here. Man was created. In man's original creation, man was what? Perfect, right? Um, and three things... He fell mentally, physically, spiritually. But then Jesus came, right? Amen. Good news. And Jesus came and sought to reverse that fall. Right? Uh, we, many different concepts in the Bible uh, are, are communicated, the gospel, on how God seeks to reverse that fall. So we don't keep on falling. We are lifted up. Which is good news, isn't it? Amen. We don't have to keep on falling. I think that's great news. So... There is a physical component. There is a mental component to us. And there is a spiritual component to us. All three of these components are working together. If one is affected, the other is affected. You hear this sometimes even in seminars, health seminars they have in sometimes the big cities. They call it body, mind, and spirit, right? They have a bit, a little bit different twist on what that looks like. And we're going to explain that in the next slide here. Or actually, not yet. It's after this slide. Adventism, it's interesting. The structure of Adventism is actually built around these three things. All of Adventism, we have three major branches of our church, right? We have our health systems, right? Our great um, hospitals. And we have a lot of education systems, don't we? A lot of local schools and, and colleges. Uh, and then we have our what? Our local churches. And then we have our conferences, which seek to kind of create unity and work with all these different branches, right? Um, so, all three of these work together. As you see back here, the physical, we have the health system, the restoration of health. For the mental, we have the education system. And the spiritual, we have the, the emphasis of spirituality in our local churches. And obviously, these are meant to overlap, not just be exclusivistic in one each of these areas. Um, that's definitely what I believe. But I think it's really cool our, how our church is structured and it's a whole structure of our church is developed for one thing. Restoration. Restoration. Isn't that awesome? Restoration. We don't have to stay where we are at. God has a plan to bring us back up. It's interesting. A lot of our education systems, you look at the seal on them um, and you see three things in the center. What do you see? Physical, mental, and spiritual. This is like the backdrop of how our church is formed, right? These three things. <clears throat> now there's one difference here uh, with, I think, um, as I mentioned, you see some of these seminars, health seminars that you see a lot of, like for instance, the New Age and stuff like that, right? They have, uh, it says body, mind, and spirit, right? The difference between Adventist theology and um, I'd say some of the New Age stuff is this difference between anthropological, this is where it gets a bit more philosophical, philosophical, monism versus dualism. Now hold on with me. 
this does make a difference and I'll continue to explain here. What is monism? Why would you bring up this in an outreach seminar? Monism, I'll explain that, uh, is a Greek word. Um, the, the definition of uh, it starts with mono, which is alone, single, or one. And uh, we see this in um, some of our words that we use in our culture today. For example, uh, monotheism, right? A belief in one God, right? Uh, Israel had a very strict view of monotheism, meaning it was exclusive, like early uh, Israel, exclusivist, exclusivistically one, literally one God. Or we can see monopoly. How many of you have played that game? For hours and hours and hours. And what do you seek to do? Take over the market. Monopolize the market. That's kind of fun, isn't it? There's another game called Risk. You basically become a monopoly of the world. Anyone ever played Risk? I love Risk. We should play after sundown. <laughs> uh, there's monogamy. Many of you believe in this. Or I'm sure you get jabbed in the side by your wife. Being married to you? One person, right? Monogamy. So this idea of oneness, okay? <clears throat> Monism basically insists that humans are not to be thought of as, as um, composed of separate entities, but rather there's this radical unity between the parts. Okay, so mental, physical, spiritual. There's a radical unity between these, right? You take one apart, you die, right? And that's basically what we see in Ecclesiastes when, the, when, the, when someone dies, their body goes to the ground, the spirit goes back to heaven, there's a separation. You can't exist apart from those being together. Hence, in the resurrection, those things come back together and there is what? Life again. <clears throat> So, uh, oh, real quickly, du uh, dualism basically believes that there are separate parts, but you can exist outside of your body, basically. That's where you get inside of some of the New Age stuff. Um, so that's where Adventism is, uh, is different. We believe there's a radical unity that we, our, our body is held together by those three things. So mental, physical, and spiritual. All right, so the question I want to ask this morning is how does restoration take place? How does transformation take place? Do you want to see people change? Especially when we do outreach. As I mentioned before, last night, some of you were there. Um, we want to see people's lives transformed, don't you? There's nothing more exciting than seeing someone's life changed for, for the good. It, it's thrilling. It's thrilling to see that, I tell you. So I want to talk about that this morning. Uh, turning to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, you can read in your Bible or follow me on the screen. It says, I therefore urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and pleasing to God. For this is the reasonable way for you to worship. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, perfect, and perfect will. Interesting. So the Bible's saying, don't be conformed to this world, be what? Transformed. By the, and how are we transformed? It says by the renewing of, mind. renewing of your mind. Does what you think matter? Amen. Does what you believe matter? Our beliefs matter. Yes. I think we really believe that as the Adventists. And if you look at history, the Protestant Reformation, there was a, the, a whole revolt, a whole upturning of what we believe and doesn't matter and I cannot trust someone else to teach me what I believe. I, must, I have, should have the opportunity to read from the Bible for myself and to study the scriptures, to seek, to understand what I believe. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, I think we have great truth, don't we? I, I believe in our message, and I think it's great. Um, and I think it does matter what you believe, and hopefully I can explain that here in the next slide. So what does what you believe actually affect you? A couple stories, and then I'll share a concept. 
there was a man named Vance Vanders. He was on his way back from work and he was heading home and he walked through the cemetery as a shortcut. A local witch doctor uh, saw him and uh, walked over to him. It was kind of uh, dusk and it was getting dark. Walked over to him and went up and waved something under his nose and said, I just pronounce a spell on you. You will die in so many days. And Vance is shooken up and he's like, wow, what actually was that? Takes off running, runs home, uh, doesn't tell anyone. And the next day he wakes up, calls him sick for work. He can't go to work. He's not feeling good. Well, a week goes by and he can't, he hasn't been able to go back to work and he's horribly sick in bed. Within two weeks, he's deathly sick and he's in bed. He finally breaks down and tells his wife. His wife, terrified, gets him to the doctor. The doctor examines him and after a day or so of examining the situation, calls the family together. And he says, uh, in, the, in the hospital room, and he says, uh, okay, I think I know what the cure is. What happened is I actually went and uh, I found that witch doctor in the cemetery and I held him up against the tree. And I said, you tell me what you did to my friend. And he, and he said, the witch doctor, what he told me is he, he rubbed uh, green lizard eggs into your abdomen and one of them hatched inside of you and it's eating you from the inside out. He goes, and I found out how we're going to get, how, how we're going to do this. We're going to put a serum in you and it's going to induce vomiting and we're going to get that lizard out of you, okay? So with great ceremony, they had the whole family around and they injected the serum into his arm and he began convulsing and throwing up like crazy. And um, the doctor had secretly taken from the... <clears throat> Uh, from the uh, pet store, a little green lizard. And he, as he's throwing up and people, ugh, throws it into the throw up. He goes, Vance, look, there's the green lizard. The curse is broken. And Vance goes, oh, fell back into bed. Fell dead asleep for a whole day. The next day he woke up and was completely fine. This is actually a true medical story. Sam Schumann was um, diagnosed with metastatic liver cancer. He was told he had three months to live. Three months. So he conducted the rest of his life as most people would in the last three months, spending time with family and so and so, uh, different acquaintances and friends. And then he passed away three months later. They did an autopsy on his body afterwards and found out that Sam Schumann actually did not have metastatic liver cancer. He simply had a tumor that was non-cancerous. Finding out, realizing that he actually died believing he had liver cancer. Interesting. One more story. Derek Adams over, uh, he um, was in, introduced to this um, deal in college where he could take on some uh, different pills from a pharmacist and they were testing out different pills. And so he gets paid for this, being a young college student, desperate for money. Oh, this is great. So he took these pills and he would have to write down and explain what they were doing to him on a weekly basis in a report. So he's taking them and what happened during this is him and his girlfriend broke up sad story. So he goes home and decides to end his life. He grabs all the pills, dumps them down his mouth, and begins, begins to convulse and, and, and his mind, he's starting to lose uh, his thoughts and really confused and moving wild all over the place. And he, he makes it to the emergency room. They lay down and they find out what he did. So they grab that bottle and they call the number and they said, what type of pills are these? And they said, it's placebo. Placebo are sugar pills, all right, or nothing pills. They're made they're, they're, uh, to see if 
They often give them to people, I hear, when they feel like they have to have some sort of pill. Well, we'll give you a placebo then. You won't even know it. And you believe that it will change you. And they actually show, scientifically, if you believe that you're getting something that's going to help you, your body will actually react and give you chemicals in your body that will actually improve your health. Interesting, huh? The power of belief is very powerful. It has power to give you life. It has power to kill you as well. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Take your life away. It's interesting. There's even books out right now. on um, The view of God that you have actually changes the landscape of your mind neurobiologically and physiologically the rest of your body. If you believe in a good God, your body changes for the good. If you believe in a, uh, a domineering, angry God, it changes literally for the bad. Something interesting to think about. So going back to this verse in Romans 12, verse 2. Uh, do not be conformed to this world, right? But be what? Transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's interesting. The first word, conformed, is basically saying that's what the world does. Do not be conformed by who? By the world. So this is the world's method of changing people. Does that make sense? The world's method of changing people is conforming them. The word conformed in the Greek is suskimatizo, which probably means nothing to you. So here's the meaning. It literally means to be molded or stamped or basically squeezed into a pattern. Right? So basically you could say it this way. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. There's this concept of this outward what? Outward pressure. Pushing someone into a certain way. Now, the word transformed is metamorphu, something you might be a little bit more familiar with. Metamorphu. Metamorphu, we have the word now metamorphosis, right? Come, that's the origin of the word. Um, and it's when a tadpole is changed into a frog or when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Caterpillars are really ugly and slimy and gross. I'm really glad they become butterflies. <laughs> but we see, we see this transformation as what? Metamorphosis, right? Have you ever seen a time lapse of a ugly, nasty caterpillar, slimy, gooey, gross thing climbing up and they go up onto like a little tiny branch in a hidden place and they attach to the branch, right? They connect to it. And there's a little long string and then their whole body is like covered in this external um, um, shell, per se, a soft shell. And then you see them like wiggling around, right? For like weeks on end and moving and all this stuff. It's really cool to watch the time lapse. And eventually you can't really see what's going on inside, right? You can see there's a struggle though, isn't there? There's a struggle and there's this transformation going on inside. And I think it's the same way as Christians. We see people going through struggles. It's because oftentimes they're going through some transformation on the inside. And then what happens eventually they pop out and poof, it's a beautiful butterfly. Thank the Lord they can change into something ugly, beautiful like that. And I think that's how it is. We are spiritually, right? We are, uh, we have all this nasty, ugly things inside of us, don't we? Because of sin. But God doesn't leave us there. He has the good news that can transform us, right? And we go through this inner transformation where we go through all these struggles. And uh, when we're going through these struggles, what do you think would happen if you walked up to that uh, little thing and broke it open? Let me help. Let, 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 me, let me make some more changes on you. What if you opened up that little cocoon and started doing that? You'd ruin it. See, there's already a natural process going on. In the same way, I think we need to work with the Holy Spirit and not enter, not get in, in the middle of certain things and people are going through things. Allow the Holy Spirit to do His thing. Be by people's side. Help, be with them in their struggles, but we can't take over their struggle for them. <clears throat> 
This same word, uh, transformed, in Romans 12, verse 2, is only listed four times in the Bible. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, if you want to turn there, 2 Corinthians 3.18 and then Matthew 17 and Mark 9 are the only other um, three occurrences. So 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. It reads, But we all, with unveiled face, Beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, our being, what is that word? Transformed, the same word in the Greek, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So transformation is taking place as we're focusing on what? On the Lord. The other verses here, Mark, uh, Mark 9 and Matthew 17, are referring to the transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured uh, from uh, into, uh, as you read those, those texts, uh, the glorious being that he was. Next here. Um, just this concept, I'm just going to share with you this one story quickly. This concept of what you believe has great power. A lot of power. Now, um, there was this golf player that was in prison, and uh, he was a fairly good golf player. He ended up spending every single day going through a full game of golf in his mind. So he'd sit down, and in his mind, he would go through the whole golf course, and he would, in his mind, be playing golf, right? He got out of prison a number of years later, and guess what he did his first day? He had a passion. He wanted to get out and play golf, right? Guess what his score was when he got out? I don't know golf scores. I've only played it a couple times. It's a lot of fun, but mine was horrible. <laughs> his was the highest he had ever had. Years not touching a golf club, and he came back, and he was able to do that. The power of your mind, the power of belief. Does what you believe matter? Amen. Absolutely, doesn't it? That's why I think our message is important, not to diminish that in one bit. Let's turn to a passage here and start bringing this home, what we're we talking about here. Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2 and verse... We're going to start in verse 1 through 12 to get some context. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Reading here, it says, And again, he, being Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Let's stop right there. The Gospels are mostly chronological, meaning they're going from the earlier parts of Jesus' life to the what? Latter parts of Jesus' life, correct? Um, if you look prior to this, in Capernaum, he had his first visit in chapter 1, verse 21. He went there, and um, it was on the Sabbath, and someone was demon-possessed, and he cast a demon out. And people were like, whoa, this is one of the first occurrences in Galilee of them seeing a demon cast out by Jesus. Their minds are blown. He has authority over the demons. This is incredible. Then he heals Peter's mother-in-law, and then he comes back um, after the sunset, and then the whole city gathers around, and he begins to heal all them that need healing. So, People are amazed, and people want to be healed, and, and Jesus is there. So, this is where we pick up again. It says, and again he entered Capernaum after some days. Maybe this was a few weeks, we don't know. Verse 3, there was someone else. It says, then they came to him, bring a paralytic who was carried by four men. Probably, most likely, a paralytic. Uh, um, um, quadriplegic, I would assume, if it had took four people. And when they could not enter, uh, come near to him because of the crowd, verse 4, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
But immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves. And he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and what? Walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, take up your bed, and walk, and go take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, went out in the presence of them all, so that they were amazed and glorifying God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Now, I want to show you something that's really fascinating about this healing and most of all the healings in the New Testament done by Jesus. <clears throat> the Hebrew writers, I'm not sure if you can quite see this, but I can give it to you later if you need to, from William Barclay, the book of the Gospel of Mark, the Hebrew writers had recognized the essential unity of the body, mind, and spirit and stressed the relative dependence of one another. Did we talk about that earlier? Right? That's Adventist belief, right? Mind, body, and spirit. Monism. They exist together. When Jesus approached this man as one whose primary need was for the assurance of forgiveness, he was reflecting the Jewish thinking of his day, that sin and health are related. But in a larger sense, he was demonstrating a recognition of the relationship which exists between attitudes of the mind and health of the body. Continue thinking on this with me. Really quick here. So Jesus came and to reach this man, and he was what? He was either a paraplegic or most likely a quadriplegic, right? So what is his what appeared as though his greatest need was? To be healed. To be able to be able to physically to walk again. But Jesus doesn't reach him on the physical level. You notice that? What did he say? He says. Your sins are forgiven you. He reaches them on the spiritual level. Check this out. This is really interesting. Physicians have discovered that guilt, like anxiety, may serve to inhibit or paralyze the functions of the body or mind. Sin really does affect us, doesn't it? When we hold on to things, it's not as though God's like, okay, you're holding on to that you're paralyzed. No, it's the natural reaction of holding on to these things inside of our souls. They, we are not built to house sin. Amen? We were not created in that image. We were created in God's image to be loving and other-centered. And when we can detox ourselves of these things, we become more of who we truly are. But as we hold on to things, different sins, they ruin us from the inside out. Isn't that true? Is that a reality? Have you seen that in your own life? Man, I've seen that in my life for sure. <clears throat> it's interesting. The boy was approached not in terms of his paralyzed legs, but on the level of his spiritual problems. Perhaps torn apart by a sense of sin, perhaps precipitated by adolescent feelings of guilt, this young man needed Jesus' reassurance of God's forgiveness of his sins. See, Jesus didn't look at the outer issue Jesus looked at the heart, the inner issue, and he met that. And so when Jesus forgave his sins, I propose that Jesus began the healing right there. He began healing him from the inside out. Because there needed to be healing first on the inside, and then there could be healing on the outside. That's just so cool. You know what? Read through the miracle stories in the New Testament and you see this similar concept of where Jesus heals people from the what? Inside out, not the outside in. That's how the world does things. They pressure people into things, right? And as Christians, the Seventh-day Adventists, we shouldn't what? pressure people into things, we should seek to work with the Holy Spirit as He's working inside of people. So he can, we can see that transformation from the inside out. That's how Jesus does things. That's how we are created. That is a fabric of our bodies, of our spirituality, of how we're composed, and how, and how we can be transformed. 
Do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Why? You just spent 40 minutes, 35 minutes explaining to me all of this, and what on earth does this have to do with outreach? It actually has everything to do with outreach. I mentioned last night, for every Adventist in the church, one million in North America, guess how many ex-Adventists there are? Two. There are two million ex-Adventists. And you know, most of those, it's not because they don't believe in the message. Guess what it is? Relationships. That's how they were treated. That's how they were, things were pushed on them. And in fact, one of the top reasons, as I've knocked on tens of thousands of doors and talked to lots of atheists, and I just seek to understand, so tell me your story. What led you down this path? And they number almost, I'd say the top three reasons why they share the place that they are is because religion was pushed on me. Yikes, right? Um, now, we should not go passive and go to the other side and not ever share anything. Amen? Yeah. We don't want to go passive and never be afraid. Oh, I'm afraid I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt someone. I'm never going to share my faith. Absolutely not. Please, share your faith. But do it not my way. Do it Jesus. God's way. Amen? Yeah. Not to... And, and my way is the external pressure, right? That's how we normally do things. We try to make people... Conform, right? But Jesus transformed. Now, one more thing here quickly. This is how God works in me and how I relate and witness to others. There is a phrase that's used in the, Old, in, the, in the New Testament. John the Baptist and Jesus used it a number of times. He referred to the Pharisees as a number of words. One of them was a brood of what? Vipers. Man, that's strong language. He said a few other words that we norm don't normally say from the pulpit about the Pharisees. Read Matthew 23, right? <laughs> Pretty strong language. Jesus, it's interesting. This phrase has, is pregnant with meaning. Let me quickly explain this. A viper was a, a deadly snake. And it was often found, uh, it would look like a stick sometimes. It would be hanging out next to sticks. It looked like it was useful. So people would often go gathering up wood and they'd accidentally grab a viper. And obviously it would turn around and bite you. And its venom would what? Kill you. Acts chapter 28. Paul goes to Malta. Remember there's a shipwreck. He goes in and he's gathering wood for the fire. And what happens? A snake bite, right? And they're amazed because he doesn't die. He shakes it off into the fire. They're amazed. They're amazed, right? Well, it's interesting. A brood is not one viper. A brood is how many vipers? A lot. A lot. It's like a big cluster of vipers, right? Another interesting fact about vipers is that not only would they just bite you and kill you, but they'd latch on to you. That's why he had to what? Shake it off, as you read there in Acts 28. Oftentimes, people would go to places like a cave or under a tree, coming through the desert, being in the Middle East, looking for a what? A shady place. A place to rest. A safe place. And they come there seeking, um, seeking a place to find some peace, to relax and sleep. And they lay down, and what would happen? All these brood of vipers that look like a bunch of sticks would latch onto them and guess what would happen? They would literally suck the life out of the person and they would what? Die. Now this is strong imagery, isn't it? Jesus is calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers. You travel over land and sea seeking to get one convert and then what do you do? You suck the life out of them. <laughs> That's what the Bible is saying. That is what it's saying there in Matthew 23. That's from the Bible, folks. Now there was a, a religious movement um, in the late 13 for, uh, or the late 14th century, 15th century. And what is that called? Reformation. The Protestant Reformation. And why was there needed to be a Reformation? 
because the religious system of that day had sucked the spiritual life out of people, right? Because why? Both of these systems sought to do what? Control and conform and what? Pressure people into their way of beliefs. And that's why Jesus had the strongest words against the Pharisees. And we see even in prophecy, Jesus is saying, we see through the prophets, stay away from this type of religion, right? Because that's not who God is. Amen? That's why it's so important. And that's why I'm sharing this this morning is do things Jesus' way. We talked about last night, the premise behind uh, Christ's method alone, the mingling, the sympathizing, the ministering to people, winning their conference, and then sharing the truth. Oh, please, get to number five. We want to share the truth. Don't throw that away just because you need to be careful and do things Jesus' way. Don't become passive and just throw witnessing away, but do it Jesus' way. Inside out. I have had more joy and more excitement and more um, energy and just happiness in life. Seeing people's lives change for the Lord. Seeing people give their hearts to the Lord. Going door to door or wherever it was. You don't have to go to door, door to door. Become friends with someone or one of your friends and start talking to them and having spiritual conversations with them. And start watching what the Holy Spirit is doing in their life. It's incredible. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit's already working on them. They were there before you were there. Or the Holy Spirit's been there already working on them before you arrived, right? That's just so exciting. So this afternoon, we're going to talk more about how to have spiritual conversations with people, how to see that transformation. And the experience I've had in ministry, I see this as really important because we want to do things Jesus' way. Because we want to see long-term transformation, not short-term, um, not a, not short-term uh, conformity. Right? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a gentleman. You don't push yourself on us, but you surely do ask permission and consistently um, seek us and pursue us. I pray, Lord, that we would not be on either side of absolute passivity and ter ter terrified and fearful of reaching out to reach people for you. Um, but on the other side, help us not to be people that try to squeeze people into molds and pressure people into religion, but to seek to do things your way, to work with your spirit as he changes people from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen.